Welcome, hello, and good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all for another virtual morning report, wherever you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, or some other time in between those, those hours. We are super excited that you're here with us this morning to join us. Um, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Jack. I use he, him pronouns. I'm one of the CP Solvers team members, uh, and I'm absolutely over the moon to get to discuss another case with you all this morning and also with my good friend, Kirtan. Kirtan, how's it going today? Hello, friends. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction, Jack. So, you know, I'm again excited to be back with the Jack because it's always a fun to discuss with the Jack because, you know, the analytical reasoning of Jack is so precise that it takes you and, you know, it kind of compels you to take a step back and think more and help the patient. So I think I'm absolutely excited for this session. And it has been almost a month. I remember that previous time it was around, you know, just after the match, so around 16th March that we discussed. And even at that time, Travis was there and Travis, you know, kindly presented the case when we had no other case presenter. So again, it could be a coincidence today that if we do not get a case presenter, then Travis is always there to help us. And, you know, as usual, friends, we would ask everyone to share their thoughts in the chat. And even in the previous time, in fact, it was the chat's thought which helped us reaching to the diagnosis. So please share your thoughts and we would try to highlight everyone as soon as possible. And let's get going. Thank you so much, Jack. Thanks so much for your kind words, Kirtan. Um, Kirtan is being very humble and kind as always. What he will, what Kirtan will never admit is that um, uh, he likes to, co to compliment me on my analytical reasoning. However, Kirtan sends me riddles very often of cases that are some of the most difficult riddles to solve, but the only way I can solve them is with Kirtan's help or with Kirtan's coaching to get to, get to the final diagnosis. So any diagnosis that I'm ever able to make is usually with Kirtan's help in these sessions as well. Um, before we get started and talking about um, uh, the actual case, I'm going to make two plugs. One of them is that if anybody has a case that they'd like to present, please do volunteer to do so in the chat. And then also, if anybody, um, if it is your first or second time joining Virtual Morning Report, please let us know. Either raise your hand, turn on your video and wave, or um, uh, uh, or type uh, type, a, type in the chat and let us know. And yes, as Travis is saying, also please check out Kirtan's new Thunderclap Headache Twitter thread. Um, it is an incredibly educational tweet tutorial. If you haven't had a chance to see it, Travis, just put it in the chat. It looks like Muhammad has a case, which is awesome. Is there anybody who is a first or second timer with us on VMR? We would love to meet you and learn more about you. Zakaria, first or a, a, a second timer. Do you mind unmuting and introducing yourself and sharing a little bit more? Hi, my name is Zakaria. Uh, I'm a sixth year medical student at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, so my second time joining. Uh, the first time I joined was uh, Kirtan pre presented a very, very difficult case of a uh, 14 year old girl with sensitivity uh, ataxia, which ended up being Friedrich's ataxia. So, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be something complex like that today, so we can always learn. Yes, we will always learn. If it if if there is any sort of difficult syndrome to figure out, and Kirtan is here, he will help us. Zachary, it's great to meet you. I would love to learn a little bit more about what you enjoy doing for fun, or or um, uh, uh, anything that you'd like to share with us about yourself or your life outside of coming to these case conferences. Uh, well, I, I'm very into specialty coffee. Uh, and making the hippie style with the pour over and so on. I'm not sure if many people know about that, but uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm fasting because it's the month of Ramadan. So I'm taking a 30 day hiatus from coffee. Uh, and that's sort of, that's quite an experience. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine a tough, uh, uh, as, as somebody who also loves making pour over coffee every single morning, um, uh, I would be very sad to have to go a whole month without it. So I mm -hmm. admire your perseverance. Is there a particular roaster in, um, in South Africa or, or otherwise that you really enjoy? You, you know, honestly, in South Africa, there are, there, there's quite a big specialty coffee scene, especially here in Cape Town. We have some amazing ones as well as in Johannesburg. But if I were to plug two, it would probably be Father Coffee and Rosetta Roastery. That if you come to South Africa, you'll find the quality is as good as anywhere in the world. Amazing. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to look them up and see if I can buy some bags of beans and get them shipped over here. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to meet you. We hope that you'll share your thoughts in the chat as well today. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And then I also see Nikita, it's your second time here as well. Nikita, are you in a place to unmute and share a little bit more about yourself? Uh, 
Hello everyone, hey Jack, um, I'm Nikita. I'm from India, I'm an international medical graduate. This is my second time around here. Um, the last time I was in this forum was quite a while back when they had solved the systemic tuberculosis case and it's been a while since I've been here. I'm currently preparing for my set two C case, so I thought this would be a great way for me to learn a little more and have some fun while studying. And yeah, I'm hoping to apply for match in the year of 24, 25 in orthopedic surgery. And this past year, I've been involved in research and I was in Hopkins for my elective. So that's me in terms of my journey right now with Emily. Well, it's great to meet you and welcome back. We're so excited that you've chosen to come back. And we hope that, that not you. only will you join us today, but also tomorrow and the weekend and next week, and that we'll continue to see you here. Um, uh, similar to... Zacharias' love of coffee. Is there anything that you'd like to share with us about yourself? What you like to do outside of uh, uh, outside of medicine, or what types of hobbies you enjoy? Um, uh, before I say that, I forgot to mention Sriram is someone uh, who has who had introduced me to this forum, and I think he's an active uh, um, a participator of this uh, forum. So I just want to uh, mention that Sriram was the one who introduced me to this. Um, my interest, I'm actually a digital illustrator too. Um, I make medical illustrations. My recent work has been for the first state US Medi Step 1 uh, book, mm -hmm. 2022 version. I'm currently also uh, working on the Step 2 CK book. So that's kind of my side hustle. That's what I do at time to time. That's my freelance work. So that's one thing about me. And also I love cooking. So that's another thing. There you go. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. And again, thank you so much for joining us again. We're really excited to have you back in the VMR space. Um, I don't want, so much. yeah, of course. Well, why don't, why don't we turn things over to Muhammad who has a case, Jeff, feel free to take over the screen and share the whiteboard and we can go ahead and get things started. But before we do that, I would love to have you introduce yourself, Jeff, so that the VMR community can meet you as our scribe today. And then also we'll have Shema, we'll have, we'll have you say hello to everybody as the person doing teaching points today. But Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, I am uh, Jeff Rowland. I go to school at Lee Common Brinton. Um, I'm currently doing a teaching elective with Dr. Smith right now. I, uh, I'm a fourth year. I just matched into orthopedic surgery at Larkin Hospital in Miami. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here to describe for us today, Jeff. And Shema, someone who needs no introduction, but we will ask you to do it anyway. Hello everyone, my name is Shema. I'm currently a fifth year medical student and a show great passion for internal medicine. So let's start. <laughs> let's do it. And then last, but certainly not least, Mohammed, um, would love to have you introduce yourself and then take us away with the case. Hello everyone, I'm Mohammed Mahdi. I'm currently a second year uh, resident, internal medicine resident at Enchamps University in Egypt. Uh, I'm outside medicine, outside the outside the residency. I like to play chess. Uh, very, very uh, enthusiastic about chess. I used to play for the university before, but right now it's very difficult to play with all the residency time schedule. So that makes sense. It can be tough. Uh, it can be tough to find time. Yeah. I have a very interesting case. So this is a 35 year old female presenting with fever for four weeks duration. All right. Do you want us to stop there? Do you want to give us a little no, bit more? I'll, I'll give you more about the HPR. So right. she started uh, She started six weeks ago to complain of earache, right earache, and which responded and she didn't take uh, notice very well about it, but she fever started after two weeks of the right ear ache with high grade, high grade fevers without rigors or chills, responding to antibiotics. And she went to her uh, primary care physicians who diagnosed her with otitis media, and she received some uh, systemic antibiotics, but uh, she did not feel any improvement. This was about the search for, uh, search for COVID. So she had also a PCR for COVID twice, with, which was negative. She denies any uh, cough, dyspnea, expectations. 
uh, no dysuria, no uh, other signs of uh, localization for that fever, no altered mental status. She denied any neck rigidity. She denied any diarrhea or vomiting. We can stop here. All right. Well, it sounds like what, what we have here is, is a young, at least as far as we know, previously healthy woman who has a subacute course of fevers characterized by a syndrome that's also associated with some, with some ear pain, but really an absence of other localizing features, including signs of, of, um, of neck pain, meningitis, and then also sy symptoms outside of the sort of um, the ear and the sinus area. So maybe what I'll do is I can sort of give us a general approach to these fevers, and then I'll kick it over to you, Kurtan, to take us through how, they, how the earache is helping us localize things. I'm seeing a lot of already phenomenal thoughts in the chat of individuals mentioning eye made and other mnemonics that can really help us think through fevers. And I will say that really when we think about fevers in, the in, in somebody coming into a general internal medicine service, right, we have this sort of horizontal differential, right, infection, malignancy, autoimmune disease, in rare cases, drugs, and in much rarer cases, endocrinopathies. But really our job as clinicians is that we not only have to think about those things in parallel, but we have to prioritize them, right? So we have to take that list and then turn it into a prioritized list of things. And I think the two things that we can use to help make that prioritize list helpful is one, what are the localizing symptoms? And then two, what is the time course of this illness? The longer somebody has had fevers, the lower the pretest probability is for an infection. However, somebody has to have fevers for a long, long time for infection to still not be the most common cause. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that when somebody has a fever for a few days, number diagnoses one, two, three, four, five on your list are going to be infections. And then far, far below that in terms of probability, we're gonna be thinking about non-infectious causes of fever. But as somebody's fever continues to persist, the probability of infection remains high, but some of the other categories of illness start to become a little bit more probable in terms of the base rate of disease for two reasons. Number one is the tempo of most, of, of most infections. And number two is that usually individuals get empiric therapy up front, right? So most of our general infections that present with fever will be within two categories. It'll be either a viral infection or an acute bacterial infection. And the general natural history of those infections usually will be ones that last for days to maybe a week or more. When we have fevers that start to persist for a longer period of time, the probability of those types of infections starts to go down. And we move towards more, more indolent subacute infectious processes like fungal organisms or mycobacterial pathogens, for example. But then the other thing that happens is that usually individuals will get treatment during that time frame, usually for an acute bacterial infection. So they will get antibiotics like this patient did too. Failure to improve with antibiotics also decreases the probability of a bacterial infectious cause and increases the probability of some of these alternative non-infectious etiologies of fever like malignancy and autoimmune disease. In a young person, we'll usually put autoimmune disease higher on the list because malignancy is oftentimes a disease of elderly individuals, but there's, but there's two types or there's two classes of malignancy to always consider in a young patient, which is going to include lymphoproliferative disorders like lymphoma, as well as hematologic malignancies like leukemia. But that is sort of how we can think about things in general, right? We're still gonna prioritize infection, but acknowledge that this has been going on for some time. So the gap between infections and other causes starts to narrow a little bit, making malignancy and autoimmune disease increase in probability, both because of the duration and because this person got antibiotics empirically to try to treat the infection. Oops. But then we also have to take into account the localizing symptoms here. And for that, I will turn it over to Kurtan. Awesome, Jack. You know, you laid down a framework through IMED Demonic excellently. And I would like to just add one point, which actually I learned from Rabi and Reza only a few months back, that whenever we are dealing with an infection, and let's say you give the drugs and the fever doesn't abate. So as Jack mentioned that, of course, we have to think about mycobacterial organisms. We have to think about the resistant bacterial pathogens and also fungal pathogens. But another thing is that, let's say if the patient is symptomatically doing well, except for the fever, then we also have to invoke the possibility that maybe, you know, drug fever is something that is contributing to the, our syndrome. That is the drug itself is causing the fever. And apart from fever, everything else is fine. So, we, you know, we can take the antibiotics, taper it down gradually and 
and then we can see whether fever goes down or not. But that's certainly not the priority because first we have to make sure that there is absolutely no infection. Now coming to the ear part, so as Jack mentioned that we have a localizing sign here. So as Mohammed mentioned that we have otitis media. So now we have to ask ourselves that if there is indeed otitis media and let's say if antibiotic did actually work but still the patient has fever, then we have to invoke the hypothesis of complications of otitis media. So what can be the complications of otitis media? So we can get tympanic membrane rupture. So it would be interesting to see if the patient has otoria, you know, some kind of discharge from the ear. That is one thing that I would ask the patient or patient's relatives. Another thing, what if the patient has mastoiditis? Because, you know, the middle ear is connected to the mastoid bone and the infection can spill into the mastoid bone. And when we have mastoiditis, the treatment is actually the surgical drainage combined with the antibiotics because it's about source control now. So antibiotics alone won't help with the fever. What else can otitis media do? So you can get the infection which spills into the brain and you can get meningitis and encephalitis. But as Jack mentioned that we have negative signs. We don't have any evidence of meningismus. We don't have evidence of alternate mental status. But still, I would keep those things in the back of my mind. And last thing is the involvement of venous sinuses. So otitis media is also known to cause sagittal sinus thrombosis. And you know, all the, all the veins which pass over the, all the sinusoids which pass over the middle ear and the inner ear. And sometimes what happens that when you have thrombosis spilling in the brain, then it can raise the ICP, it can contribute to alter mental status, it can contribute to fever, and then that infection can also spread forward to cavernous sinus and cause all other symptoms. So we have to be vigilant about the spread of infection because it could be catastrophic. And usually the fungal infections, which Jack was mentioning, have propensity to invade the vascular structures and cause such kind of things. And lastly, I would like to mention one last pathogen, which is the pseudomonas. So, you know, as we have learned numerous times that pseudomonas is one of those antigens, I mean, one of those pathogens, which can cause otitis externa as well as otitis media. And it is not covered by many antibiotics because many of the strains are very, very resistant. So we have to invoke the hypothesis that maybe it was due to pseudomonas. And let's see if we can tackle the autoimmune hypothesis in the next helicot once you get the more data. And meanwhile, Jack, before we move to the next helicot, do you think that uh, we can highlight some of the comments from the chat if you think uh, they are indeed nice? Oh my gosh, there are too many nice ones to even sift through. Absolutely brilliant thoughts from you, Kirtan, and also the great thoughts in the chat. I would love to kick it over. Um, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe I can turn it over, actually bring in Zacharia into the fold here to talk a little bit more about what you were mentioning in terms of the ear pain being referred from the oral pharynx and the neck. And then, and then Angelita, I'm going to come to you if you're able to unmute after Zachariah talks to talk about some of these really, really thoughtful questions that you asked. Uh, okay, so with regards to the ear pain, uh, I think uh, many malignancies like squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx is known to radiate to the ears. And I was also thinking perhaps at that time cause some sort of lymphoma or something or some sort of salivary gland tumor could definitely present with pain referring to the ears. Amazing. I think brilliant thoughts, right? So we're already starting to not to sort of take the localization of this pain, but also not, not just think about the area of the body, but the, but the specific structures that are involved. And then Angelita, could I come to you in terms of asking about these questions around otorrhea, hearing loss, vertigo? How are, um, uh, what types of, of disease processes are you thinking about by asking those questions? Jack, the Angelita mentioned that she is with patients. Oh, currently. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but thanks for sharing your thoughts, Angelita. All right. Well, then maybe we can turn it back over to Muhammad to take us through the next aliquot. Ending discussions. Uh, so the patient has a, has a history of bronchitis in childhood, where she takes uh, as needed inhalers, and her asthma is controlled. She was also diagnosed uh, four months ago with autoimmune cellulitis where she takes uh, replacement therapy. Her other medications other than atroxin, uh, it's, she occasion non steroids for, for her period cramps. She also had the surgery uh, and appendectomy 20 years ago without any complication. So the examination of the patient, her temperature at admission was 38.2 Celsius. Blood pressure was 140 over 80, heart rate was 98, 
Saturation was 97 on room air with respect rate of 16. She had a uh, pallor, but no, just no jaundice or cyanosis. The ENT exam showed um, no vesicles, showed protruding tympanic membrane uh, without ev any evidence of perforation on the right side. The left side was completely normal. Uh, no palpable lymph nodes at all. Um, abdominal, abdominal exam was completely normal. Cardiovascular was completely normal and the pulmonary exam was completely normal. Uh, her extremities showed bilateral low limb edema, uh, soft pitting at the level of blue knee, and we can stop here. Nice, Mohammed. Thank you so much. So it sounds like we have the primary exam findings are this bulging tympanic membrane and then pitting edema to the level of the knee. Was there anything else that we potentially um, is there anything else to highlight on the on the board here? I just want to make sure that we were able to get to get all yeah, of the data. She there. had pallor. Power. She was pain. Great. All right. Well, maybe I can start by sort of taking us through how the background medical history could be and could be in, informing things here. And then I'll leave it to Kurton to take us through some of the different physical exam findings. So I think, right, whenever, right, whenever we see somebody's background medical history come into the fold in a case, we have to sort of decide for ourselves which features of this person's past, past medical history are going to inform our approach to the chief concern that we have here, right? If you all had the opportunity to check out the clinical reasoning boot camp session led by Ravi, Franco, Madalena, Kurton, and many of the other CP Solvers team members, you will see the um, the importance of what data we do and do not in, and do not integrate into the problem representation. And so I will definitely turn to you for a deep dive into that. But what we are tasked here to do now is to decide how is this patient's asthma and how is this patient's autoimmune thyroiditis influencing the way that we think about these four weeks of fevers. And I would say that for right now, I'm actually not bringing the asthma into the fold in a substantial way yet. The reason for that is that certainly asthma can be a disease process associated with fevers. However, I would oftentimes expect us to see more prominent respiratory tract symptoms if that were the case. One way that we can hold on to it is if, is if we question whether or not this is indeed a true diagnosis of asthma. There are there are, um, uh, I would say that one of the one of the helpful pearls that I've received from one of the brilliant pulmonology attendings here, um, who I've gotten to learn from, Dr. Lakshmi Santosh, is that not all that wheezes is asthma. And so, if we say that if we believe the diagnosis of of asthma here, I think it's difficult to bring it into the fold. But if we question the validity of the diagnosis of asthma, and we say that this is somebody who has had an indolent course of respiratory symptoms, and now we see sinus symptoms and subacute fevers that can change things a little bit. And the way that that changes things for us is it makes us think about non-infectious diseases that are characterized by sinopulmonary, sinopulmonary symptoms, which, in, which could include some of the autoimmune disorders that I know that I've learned a ton from, from Kurton, particularly the ankyvasculitides, whether that's granulomatosis with polyangiitis or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. That is still going to sit much lower on our list than many of the, of the, of the infectious causes that we talked about. But it does help us to highlight that when we see the diagnosis of asthma in the past medical history, we can either choose to believe that it is a solid diagnosis if we have and can review the diagnostic testing, or we may wonder if this was an empiric diagnosis and we have to now think about that, that this is a disease characterized by pulmonary symptoms as well. The autoimmune thyroiditis is a much easier link. Where there is one autoimmune disease, there can be many other autoimmune diseases. And so in this case, when we were thinking about our general approach to fevers, autoimmune disease is certainly on the list. So that this woman has had a prior autoimmune disease that has been diagnosed, it also increases the pretest probability for another autoimmune disease coming up. We sometimes call this an autoimmune diathesis, which means that when an individual has one autoimmune disease, they may be predisposed to developing other, other autoimmune diseases later. However, right, we have to take these hypotheses that we just generated about the background history and lump them into the overall probabilities that we're considering. By no means do any of these pieces of background information make infection less likely. If anything, they just help us draw a causal link between some of the autoimmune hypotheses that we generated. And those being 
um, wondering whether or not this is a sinopulmonary disease that could be autoimmune in nature. Again, small vessel vasculitis is one of those disease processes, as well as thinking about, is there just another autoimmune syndrome that's gonna be emerging in general because of the history of autoimmune thyroiditis. But I think that the exam is really gonna help us start to make more progress than just these, um, than just this pontification by me. So I will leave it to Kirtan for that. Sure, thank you so much, Jack, for giving us pointers that how we can proceed. And I wanted to highlight two examination points including the vitals. So if you see the vitals, we have the evidence of fever and the patient's blood pressure is elevated. Now, if you think about it, in any sort of illness, when there is inflammation, because of the stress of the illness itself, you can get elevated blood pressure. So first we have to make sure that the elevated BP persists during the hospital admission, despite the treatment and despite, you know, weeks and weeks of treatment. And when that is the cause, we have to ask ourselves that what is causing the hypertension in such a young patient? Because the patient is already taking levothyroxine, which means we know that the patient is not in the hyperthyroid phase of the autoimmune thyroiditis. He is in the hypothyroid phase, not in the hyperthyroid phase. So you would expect the BP to be on the lower side, not on the higher side. Now, what Jack mentioned that if we have the edema, so what are the common points that we have to ask? Us? So could this be the heart problem? Could this be the liver problem? Could this be the malnutrition problem? That is the low albumin. And finally, could this be the renal problem? And now if we actually believe that hypertension is actually real, then what can tie all of them together? See, in examination, we don't have any evidence of crackles. So we are assured that probably the patient doesn't have terrible heart failure causing the edema. Similarly, we don't know whether the patient's BMI is so low and there is no evidence that the patient has cirrhosis so far. So the liver cause is also less likely. So finally, we are left with the kidney. And now in the kidney, we know that nephritic syndrome as well as the nephrotic syndrome, as well as the pre-renal pathologies, so things like renal artery stenosis can contribute to hypertension. And what Jack was mentioning that many of the small vessel vasculitis and connected tissue disorders have propensity to affect the renal arteries, not only the pre-renal one, but also the renal arterioles. And when we have the ANCA vasculitis, then you will classically get the nephrotic nephrotic picture, which can explain the edema as well as the elevated blood pressure. So urine analysis will be really interesting. And I would also like to get the complement levels because you know complement levels will paint an idea whether this is indeed a complement mediated process or the posse immune kind of process. And the reason why I am mentioning the complement levels is that because many times in the VMR, you know, past I have learned that sometimes what seems like autoimmune process is include is indeed not an autoimmune process. Maybe it is, you know, endocarditis, maybe it is lymphoma, which is mimicking the autoimmune disorders. And in such cases, complement levels can be really helpful because if you have, let's say, you know, abscess somewhere in the body, so that means you have antigen in your system. Antibodies will form against that antigen and then that antigen antibody complex can deposit in the renal vessels and can contribute to glomerulonephritis, elevated blood pressure, edema and everything. So that is something known as glomerulonephritis secondary to visceral abscess. So that's why endocarditis is something that I'm still considering apart from the ANCA vasculitis. So I guess getting the complement levels and urine analysis will be really helpful moving forward. And Jack, do you have any final thoughts? No, just that I'm really excited to see where this case goes. Sure, sounds good. So for some basic labs, so we have a TLC of 12, mostly neutrophilia, 78% neutrophils and 9.1 lymphocytes. I have a hemoglobin of 7, normocytic, microcytic, normocytic, normochromic. Uh, MCE was 81, MCH was 26, with platelets of 300. Also have basic uh, chemistries. We have a, a BUN of 67. Uh, creatinine of 2.7, sodium 130, potassium 4.2, albumin was 2.2, AST and ALT were normal, calcium was 8.4, phosphorus was 8.4, magnesium was 2.3. And urine analysis, we have uh, Y plus cells 12 to 15, RPCs were 80 to 85, albumin plus two, no costs, no crystals. And we have a spot protein creatinine ratio of two grams.
some um, some uh, cult we have cultures during cultures speaking cultures and blood cultures were all negative. An echo was done to rule into Cordatus was negative. Just X ray was also negative. We have an ESR of over 100 and a CRB of 216 with a reference up to 500, with a reference of 5. And I can stop here before the immunological marks. Well, I will um, thank you again, Mohammed. I will talk about the CDC and the metabolic panel and leave everything else to Kurtan because I, uh, uh, given how excited I feel, uh, or I shouldn't say excited, given how um, how interesting I'm finding these findings, they are, um, I think, diagnostically interesting to think through, but but, but potentially quite concerning for the patient. Um, uh, I will leave the urinalysis and everything else to Kurtan to talk through. But I will say that of 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 the labs that that we have here is actually the metabolic panel and specifically the creatinine that is giving us, I think the most diagnostic utility. Yes, we have a CDC that has a neutrophilic leukocytosis and an anemia. Um, however, in the setting of any sort of progressive systemic illness, it is not unreasonable, whether that's an infectious disease, an autoimmune disease, or a malignant process, the diagnostic utility of the CDC um, does not offer us much here. One thing that it can help us with is that within the autoimmune disease category, it can help us start to localize a little bit. What I mean by that is that certain, certain autoimmune diseases like connective tissue diseases, for example, lupus, will oftentimes be characterized by cytopenias. And so we will see leukopenia, lymphopenia, occasionally neutropenia, as well as anemia and thrombocytopenia. Other classes of autoimmune diseases, whether those are vasculitides or things like inflammatory arthritides, like rheumatoid arthritis, or things like sarcoid, they will oftentimes be characterized by a leukocytosis. And so what the CDC can help us with here a little bit is that it, what it, I should say what it doesn't do is it doesn't meaningfully change how we were thinking about infection versus malignancy versus autoimmune disease, because diseases in all of those categories can cause a neutrophilic leukocytosis. But if we are continuing to move forward the autoimmune disease hypothesis, the presence of the neutrophilic leukocytosis may lean us towards a vasculitis or an, or an, an inflammatory arthritis. And given what, what, what we've talked about here, that can be helpful. I should say that that rule should not be taken as a rule, but rather as a guidepost because certainly individuals who have an underlying connective tissue disease can get a systemic infection and then that hypothesis breaks down. But really where things are super, where, um, uh, where we can make a lot of progress here in understanding this patient's illness is through the metabolic panel because we have an acute kidney injury and it's not just any acute kidney injury. I'll turn it over to Kurtan to help us think through what kind of acute kidney injury it will be. But what I, what I, what I will say is that normally when someone comes into the hospital with, with an AKI, we will think about pre-renal and post-renal sort of right, right next to each other. The base rate of disease says that anyone who comes into the hospital with an AKI, it is most likely pre-renal and etiology, and we will respond to fluids or diuretics. Another test that we can easily test for is a post-renal acute kidney injury. We can look for urinary retention on a bladder scan or fairly quickly get a renal ultrasound to look for signs of hydronephrosis. So oftentimes the way that we move through an acute kidney injury is we think about pre, we think about post, if those hypotheses are falsified, then we'll think about an intrarenal cause. But there are two scenarios in which we should think about an intrarenal cause first above all else. And that's when we have a disease signature of nephrotic syndrome or a disease signature of a glomerulonephritis. And now I will turn it over to Kurtan to take us through whether or not we're in that situation here. Sure. And you know, at this point, I would like to comment Jack only because I remember that four weeks back, we were discussing one case and Jack taught me that sometimes in nephritic syndrome, you expect that patient would have RBC cast in the urine, right? But you know, it's very similar to how in patients with Guillain Barre syndrome, initially for a few days, you may not get cytoalbuminergic dissociation in the CSF, but after four or five days, you will get that and you will also get areflexia later in the disease course. So same is true for glomerulonephritis. So many of the nephritic syndrome, be it lupus nephritis, be it enca vasculitis, be it good pasture syndrome, often initially we don't tend to get the RBC cast in the urine. So we have to repeat the urine analysis. So actually that is what Jack told me four weeks back that in their patient, when they repeated the urine analysis, there was evidence of RBC cast. 
So that is the first thing that we can't rule out the nephritic syndrome just yet because of the absence of RBC cast because RBCs are still there. And finally, what about the nephrotic syndrome? So this could be very well compatible with nephrotic syndrome, but we also need the evidence of you know hyperlipidemia because that is the classic signature of nephrotic syndrome. And even if it is nephrotic syndrome, there isn't you know it it is not strange to think that maybe we can have nephrotic nephrotic overlap because there are many disorders which can present with both components. Now, if it is indeed nephrotic syndrome as of now, then what are some of the possibilities in our case? So, as per the base rate, diabetes is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome. But in our case, we are not concerned about it. Apart from that, there is the category of minimal chain disease, which is usually seen in the kids. It can be seen in the adults as well, but usually it is attributed to thymoma or some other perineoplastic disorder, which we don't have evidence of in our case. So, we are left with the membranous nephropathy, and then we are left with the IgA nephropathy. Now the reason why I say IgA nephropathy because often you know just like post streptococcal gonorrhea nephritis, IgA nephropathy is one of those disorders which can be triggered by any sort of infection, be it enteric infection, be it mucosal infection of the respiratory tract. Because after all, if we remember, then IgA antibodies are present in the mucosal barriers, right? So any sort of infection which hits the mucosa can trigger the IgA nephropathy. So the fact that the patient had this earache and all this fever four to six weeks back, what if that triggered the IgA nephropathy? But the thing is that usually IgA nephropathy is seen nephritic. So like it presents along with the infection and not later to the infection. So still, you know, complement levels are important because in IgA nephropathy, the complement levels are usually normal, just like NK vasculitis. Whereas if it is indeed PSGN or lupus nephritis, then they would be low. Now regarding the lupus, as Jack mentioned, that we would expect the pain cytopenia. But you know, then we have this we have this component of infection, so that can be confounding with our uh, this pain cytopenia thing. So it could still be lupus nephritis because we know that lupus class five nephritis can present as pure nephrotic syndrome. So that is also on the differential diagnosis. So you know, these are all of my thoughts at this point in time, and I think getting in complement levels, getting the ANS serologies would really guide us moving forward. And Jack, do you have any final thoughts before we can move ahead? I do not have any final thoughts. I just think that there has been so many phenomenal things in the chat that I would love to highlight a couple individuals. Um, I think Shri is asking a great question about HUS and TTP and whether or not that can be a complication of, of otitis media. Shri Ram, do you mind unmuting and sharing a little bit more about sort of how you're approaching that hypothesis overall? Hey everyone, thanks for the great discussion. So I was just thinking HUS, TTP, uh, I know there were new neurological issues, but we had fever, we had anemia with a normal MCV. Uh, I didn't see the platelet count before, so I thought there was some sort of thrombocytopenia, and we had renal failure. So uh, that got me thinking, you know, could could TTP or HUS happen after otitis media? Because it seemed like she had otitis media initially, and then then she developed the fever and the rest of her complications. So so that that that's what I was thinking. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I wanted to call back. Angelita put in the chat a great response to a question that we had asked earlier in terms of in terms of her sharing her thinking about some of the questions that she asked. And I just wanted to wanted to elevate that because I think it was some great points. When when Angelita previously was asking about things like dizziness and otorrhea and vertigo, um, she was thinking about the possibility of neuronitis or a labyrinthitis or any other cranial nerve pathology, which I think is something that's really important to think about, particularly as we consider to advance forward the possibility of the vasculitis hypothesis, because we've talked about sinus complications, we've talked about kidney complications, but neurologic complications are also ones that can be there. So understanding whether or not that is a disease or a disease characterization that we're dealing with can also be really helpful here going forward. Um, but uh, uh, maybe now in the, in the interest of time, I will turn it back over to you, Mahama, to take us through with some more information. Excellent, excellent discussion, Sleeper. So our immunological markers, we have a negative ANA, negative anti-DNA, C3 was 113, which is normal, C4 was 24, which is normal, both anchors were, ne were negative. Uh, we have also uh, C, uh, hepatitis C virology, hepatitis B virology, and HIV were all negative. And now I would like to ask, how would you, uh, how would you take it to the next step? We suspected an autoimmune disease, but now all the autoimmune markers were negative. 
This is a great question. I will share my thoughts a little bit, and then I will turn it over to you, Kirtan, to advance us forward. I would say, you know, we have to grapple with, with asking ourselves, what is the negative predictive value or the sensitivity of any of these tests? I would say this, the, the negative ANA and the negative anti-double-stranded DNA are, um, do a pretty good job of helping us decrease the probability of lupus in the setting of a signature of disease that wasn't necessarily perfectly compatible with that, right? So we have negative tests that are fairly good in the setting of a moderate to low pretest probability. So I think that can help us take things like lupus off the list. Whether or not the P Inca or the C Inca being negative is incredibly helpful, I think is a much, much more difficult problem because we can have Inca negative small vessel vasculitis, you can have Inca negative GPA, you can have Inca negative MPA, and we can have other small vessel vasculitides that are Inca negative. And so I think that the negative predictive value of that is much less likely, and we may have to rely on a tissue diagnosis to formally, um, uh, to formally evaluate or frame the probability of an Inca vasculitis. For example, if we see a posse, uh, a posse immune glomerulonephritis on a kidney biopsy, that would outweigh the negative Inca serologies because that would be a sign that we may be dealing with an Inca associated vasculitis or some of the other posse immune Inca vasculitides. Um, and then I think there's a myriad of other autoimmune diseases that we haven't necessarily looked for in terms of these autoimmune testing that we have. Something that is quite helpful is the normal complement levels. If we think about things that can cause a normal complementemic glomerulonephritis, that's going to include things like the posse immune vasculitides, but also things like IgA vasculitis as well. And so those, again, are going to be diagnoses that are advanced forward more often on biopsy than necessarily on serologies here. So I would say like, and I'm, 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 I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Kirtan, but I would say this helps us take lupus significantly out of play, but some of the other vasculitides I think are harder to rule out, particularly the Incas and then other things that are less likely based on the disease process or are, are less likely based on, the, based on the patient's symptoms, but certainly still in the fold like the IgA related vasculitides. Sure, you know, I agree with you, Jack, that for GPA and MPA, actually, NCAS do a pretty decent job, you know, so like they are positive in around 70 to 80 percent of the patients, but for EGPA, they don't do a very good job. So still, NCA vasculitis is on the differential along with IgA nephropathy. And another interesting thing, which, you know, I, re I remember just because you were, you know, prompting us that what are other normal complementary disorders. So now when we think about the IgG4 related disorders, we know that classically they cause the low C4 and normal C3. But there have been subsets of IgG4 related disorders in which you can get tubular intestinal nephritis as well as membranous nephropathy concurrently, and that can present as normal complement levels. So that is something that I would you know keep at back of my mind. And again, as per the initial discussion, that good pasture disease. Now we know that in good pasture syndrome, usually we think about the involvement of alveoli as well. But there is something known as like anti-GBM disorder, which can classically involve only the renal vessels, and maybe the you know ear involvement is unrelated. If we think about that for a second, because GBM is also associated with normal complement levels. So that is another possibility. And finally, let's say that what if all these are not possible? Like what if all these turns out to be negative? Then finally, we have to ask ourselves that our initial step, that could this be just an nephrotic syndrome and not nephrotic syndrome? And if it is indeed just an nephrotic syndrome, then we are talking about the FSGS, we are talking about the membranous nephropathy. Now, all the causes of membranous nephropathy like HPV, HCV, HIV, all the drugs, we don't have evidence of any of that here. But FSG, as you know, sometimes you can present in young age patients because of variety of genetic disorders. So maybe we can consider the diagnosis of FSGS if all these other anti-GBM, and kind everything is negative. And again, I agree with Jack that renal biopsy is certainly something that we can consider. And the patient is not coagulopathic. Like the patient's platelets are fine. The patient is relatively stable. So there is no clear contraindication for renal biopsy. So we can move ahead with renal biopsy and then see what the tissue shows. Brilliantly said, Kirtan. Mohammed, in the interest of time, why don't you sort of take us home to where this case concludes, and then we can reflect together and then turn it over to Shema for the teaching points. So we took a renal biopsy. Uh, it was adequate. It showed uh, uh, 18 glomeruli with recent formation of 35%. It also showed a uh, uh, immune, immune complex deposition for IgA, IgM, C3, and C4, which is typical for uh, lupus nephritis. So the diagnosis was a seronegative 
is seronegative lupus nephritis in a 35-year-old female. Yes, that's a full house immunochemistry. Wow. I am I am absolutely floored. A nor a ANA negative, double stranded DNA negative, normal complementemic lupus nephritis. This is incredible. What an amazing, amazing case. And you know, Jack, even the complement levels are surpassing, right? Because if the patient has full house pattern, which means we know that this is not the nephrotic thing, this is the nephritic part, so like class one to four, and still the complement levels are normal. So that's very surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Mohammed, this is an absolutely fantastic case. I would love to learn from you what you learned about coming about coming to this final final diagnosis. Uh, it was an interesting uh, trip to with this patient, as as we always had we suspected was she was lupus, and we even repeated the ANA twice and repeated all the immunological markers. C three and C four were always were always within normal. Uh, normal levels and we were just as surprised with the, with the new diagnosis of lupus class four lupus nephritis wow and how did it was amazing to, it was amazing to see that uh, how uh, how to find a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis in a patient with, with such low uh, immunological marks a yeah. uh, patient um she received first. Uh, she received uh, pulse steroids followed by uh, cyclophosphamide. There was a debate for about cyclophosphamide, and she was new, newly married, and we were concerned about uh, about uh, fertility. So we had to talk to her about all the uh, complications of lupus and uh, its treatment. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'm getting a, we're we're getting a couple questions in the chat about how did how did your team integrate the ear pain? Was that thought to be directly related to the lupus, or was that thought to be just a chronic infection that had developed in the setting of her lupus? No, we just we thought that it was an infection because she, because of the lupus. Um, we were more concerned with the kidney functions. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Muhammad, this was an incredibly educational case and an absolute joy to think through. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just absolutely floored by it. It was so fun to learn. Um, uh, Kirtan, thank you for such a brilliant discussion. Um, as always, lupus and vasculitides and glomerular nephritis is a humbling, humbling space to think through. Um, and I will be spending a lot of time reading about, um, uh, about this specific subtype of lupus, but also refining my approach to these different conditions. So thank you so much for bringing this case to us. It was just so much fun. Kirtan, I'll turn it over to you for any final reflections and, and then let you pass the baton to Shema for a full house teaching points as well. Very nice fun, Jack. You know, and I just wanted to thank the Muhammad for a very brief and, you know, yet succinct presentation. I mean, he spoke so less, but still he taught us so much, you know, so like that is what I loved about it. That it was very succinct and to the point. So thank you so much, Muhammad, for coming all the way from Egypt to present a case to us. And we would love to see you again next time, maybe as a discussion and maybe even in the chat to participate if you want. So thank you so much. And now, Shema, please take us home. Hello everyone, such a great case and discussion. Just to keep it short, I will start with the teaching points. So we were talking about the chief complaint of fever and we have this IMA mnemonic. And the important thing is to know whether it's infectious or more malignant. We, ha we have to uh, ask ourselves two questions to prioritize the etiology. So the first thing is localization of the symptoms and the second one is a time course So the longer. Um, the longer the, uh, the fever uh, is there, the lower is the pretest probability for infection. And also the failure to improve the antibiotics also makes uh, an infectious agent less likely. And a fever in a young patient uh, consider lymphoproliferative diseases like lymphoma, but also uh, consider that um, we also have something like drug-induced fever. And now coming to ear, ear pain, um, uh, we uh, consider things like small vessel, uh, small vessel uh, vasculitis, like GPA, as we know, for like um, relapsing otitis media. Think of GPA, relapsing polychondritis, 
but uh, also other etiologies. And uh, in terms of otitis media, we were talking about the complications like tympanic membrane rupture, mesoiditis, meningitis, encephalitis, and also for the bug pseudomonas, uh, remember it can both cause otitis media and externa. And then we were talking about asthma as we were talking that um, not all wheeze is asthma and asthma can also be associated with fever. Uh, like and we were also um, trying to link it to uh, a vasculitis like EGPA. But uh, here in this case, we didn't have any rest, uh, not really a lower resp respiratory tract involvement. And uh, uh, collecting the clues for autoimmune disease, we were uh, thinking of sinopulmonary involvement, again, thinking of small vessel vas vasculitis, and also thinking about that um, this patient had a prior autoimmune disease, so which could also increase the pretest pre probability for another autoimmune disease. Then talking about edema, we prioritized the kidney um, as the uh, primary uh, um, etiology. And uh, in ter terms of the kidney, think of in a young patient, there was high blood pressure, consider renal arterial stenosis, and, but also small vessel ves vasculitis leading to uh, anchor associated glomerulonephritis or nephritic or nephrotic syndromes. And uh, what also Kirtan said, uh, always look at the complement level because we're also like mimics that can cause uh, glomer glomerulonephritis like endocarditis. And then we were talking about the role of the complete blood count in autoimmune diseases because it helps us to localize uh, the lesion. Like in terms of connective tissue diseases like lupus, we would expect uh, cytopenias or generally something like pancytopenia in the worst case. And if we have leukocytosis, especially in neutrophilic leukocytosis, think of sarcoid or vasculitis. And then we we're talking about acute kidney injury. It's most likely pre renal or post renal. Uh, post renal can be usually excluded by ultrasound to look for urinary retention. And in terms of intrarenal, think of nef nephrotic syndrome and glomerulonephritis. And uh, the usual uh, suspects for nephrotic syndrome are minimal chains, especially in children, membranous, uh, look at uh, hepatitis B serology. And um, in IgA, uh, think of um, a prior um, mucosal infection and, also, and then uh, FSGS, look for HIV. And um, then we were talking about the pretest probability of a negative a a ANAs, which usually rule out SLE, but we have seen in this case, uh, we, we had a case of neg a negative ANA case of SLE. And um, what I also learned knew that negative ANAs don't rule out a small vessel vasculitis. So we, uh, you should always perform a renal biopsy to exclude it and to look whether there's a post immune pattern. And then, um, uh, which uh, things can cause normal complement, look at post-immune glomerulonephritis, IgA, and uh, NTGBM. And uh, uh, last but not least, um, in terms of IgD4, uh, it can cause membranous nephropathy or interstitial nephritis. So thank you very much. Awesome teaching, Seema, as always. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everybody. This was a blast. So much fun to think through it with you. And thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts. We will see you next time. Have a great rest of the day.